Real quickly, if you got your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 9? The book of Matthew chapter 9. I want to start reading with verse 18. I'm reading out of the old King James Version. I love it because it's poetical. Because most people don't quote the Amplified. Even Creflo had to read it. <laughs> and they got a lot of words in them. <laughs> Boy, you ever seen Hebrews 11.1 1 in the Amplified? Now faith is... <laughs> Lord Jesus, take a supercomputer to get through the verse. But you understand it. That's a good translation. I want to read the word of God tonight. Now, uh, and as I said, it, I'm going different tonight than I'm doing in my day sessions. But I will say this again, preaching should never supersede thought. It should make you think. When you understand the power of the word of God, and I'm going to say something going to shock you. When you miss church, you lose money. What? Let me say it again. When you miss church, you lose money because you lost the faith that you didn't hear. And faith cometh by hearing. Faith don't stack up. I wish it did. If you've been saved 45 years, you don't have 45 years of faith. You may have 45 years of experience. Faith cometh. It come by hearing, not by heard. So I tell people, you miss church. And I'm not just saying that so you can come to church. But you, 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 are, you lose spiritually, physically, and financially because you wasn't there to hear. Plus receive the corporate anointing that are in the church with the other people around you. Line upon line, precept upon precept, all plugged together. So all the voltage is running in the same, in the same line and that current's flowing. I want to read Matthew chapter 9. We'll start with verse 18. While he spake these things to them, behold, there came a certain ruler that worshipped him, saying, now no, he worshipped him, saying, my daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. Watch Jesus. Jesus rose, followed him, and so did his disciples. Verse 20. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, underline that statement. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about when he saw her. He said, daughter, he put her in the family. Be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. What made her whole? Faith. What made her whole? What made her whole? Amen. All right. Go with me to Mark chapter 5. We're going to read the other a part of this here to see how Mark writes this. In Mark chapter 5, verse 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jair, as by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Now notice they said they worshiped him nigh. This, see, that's what I love about the four gospels. They give you insight and light on different things. People see things differently. Some people see a glass half empty, others see it half full. So that's why it's good that you should reference everything so you can understand the full picture because you, it should never supersede thought. It should make you think. He fell at his feet and besought him greatly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Now we found out how little she was. I pray thee come and lay thy hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. And Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. Underline the word thronged and the word him. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had, it was nothing better but rather grew worse when she heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing him in himself, that virtue had gone on him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? I'm going to go a little further. He looked around about to see her that, that see her that had done this, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Why? She wasn't supposed to touch this rabbi. She was unclean. He said unto her daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. There's a reason that he pulls her out of the crowd. We'll deal with that in just a minute. She was just good enough to touch him, get a miracle and take off. 
But Jesus did something because he knows how religious people think. And he stops it before they start thinking it. Right there at that place. Go with me to Luke chapter 8. Hallelujah, Luke chapter 8. Here is another rendition of this. So you can get the full picture of what's happening here. Luke chapter 8, I believe verse mm -hmm, 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. Now we know who he, what his position was. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one only daughter, about 12 years of age. Now we know the age of the daughter. Do you see the different, all the information that's taking place as you reference and go with the word of God? Because God knew you had to have at least four gospels. Because everybody sees things differently. And he, he has it right down called Holy Canon. For she was about 12 years of age and she lay a dying. But as he went, the people thronged him. Right? Underline that again. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physician, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. So now you know where she grabbed his garment. And immediately there, her issue of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee, underline the word thronged thee, and pressed thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody had touched me, for I perceive that virtue is going out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. I'm going to go back to verse Matthew chapter 9, verse 22. For she said within herself. Amen. Title of this message today, it's what's on the inside that changes the outside. You can write that down as a title. It's what's on the inside of you that will change the outside of what you see, any five senses that you operate and function. For she said within herself. Now, how many of you are saying, what are you saying inside yourself? What are you saying at this believers convention inside yourself? Are you looking for someone to be your source or your source is yourself within yourself? Because the next thing if you understand and you are believing this within yourself, the next thing is an action. The next thing, faith without works is dead. Next thing is now you're going to do something. So write this down. The smallest effort of belief will bring a response from God. For she said within herself, if I could but touch the hem of his garment or the border, I will be healed. She had no evidence to the fact that she would be healed other than what people said. I made you underline the word throng. See, there's a lot of people around Christianity, but how many people are touching Jesus? Even the disciples thronged Jesus and wasn't touching him the way that girl was touching him. How many people are coming to meetings? My God, and are thronging this, but never touching it. How many people since I've been a part of these believers convention are no longer here? Let me help you. In the thousands, they thronged the believers convention, but they never touched what was in it. Do you see that? See, because what's on the inside of you is what changes the outside. If you want to get a healing on the outside, you got to get a healing on the inside. You got to have it inside you before it ever manifests on the outside. So the smallest effort of belief will bring a response from God. What does that mean? Write this down. Faith has a divine power to discover Christ. Yet you can walk in Christianity, churches all over the world, thronging Christ, thronging Christianity, but not touching him. People get mad at me because I have more than prayer. I, 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 come on, Baba. Thank you, Lord. Let me just tell you the truth. I don't pray a lot. What? Now, if they edit me right there, Lord, they could just write some trash. That's called fake news. I don't pray a lot because praying is this. It's like I come to Jesus and oh, Lord, oh, gee, help me, Jesus. Oh, gee. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I have a lot of conversations with God. I go in my study and I sit down and I say, look, let's talk. And he likes fellowship. Paul was called a pestilent fellow. 
a real pest. If you look in the Greek, it means a Christian disease. You got around Paul, he infected you with God. So faith has a divine power to discover Christ, number one. This is what's happening in that woman when she said within herself, faith comes with an implicit trust in Christ. She said, if I could touch him, she's trusting something she hadn't touched yet. Because she said within herself, she's calling those things would be not as though they were. She's producing Romans 417 before Romans 417 was ever wrote. Do you see that? So the smallest effort to believe will bring a response from God. How's it done? Faith has a divine power to discover Christ. Faith comes with an implicit trust in Christ. Trust is a beautiful word. Number three, and I'll go over it again after a while. Faith seeks. What does it seek? It seeks comfort. What is the comfort? What, what makes faith comfortable? Close contact with Christ. Faith seeks for its comfort and that comfort is close contact with Christ. That's why I like talking to God in conversations. Hey, Jesus, what do you think about that? We've had some of the greatest conversations. Uh, Bill Winston one time said something, and he, he, uh, he said, Jesse, I'm going to preach it. I was in my, I was having a conversation. And all of a sudden, the Lord just went off the rails. He said, you know, I'm God. I, I got the power to, to, to take your life. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> First thing I thought, that I'd do something wrong. He said, but I don't have the authority to do it. Now, that kind of blew me away. I said, what did you say? He said, Jesse, I'm God. I have the power to take your life, but not the authority. I said, well, who's got it? He said, you. He said, death and life's in the power of your tongue, not mine. Now, how long you want to live? Then he said this. We was in conversations, Billy. He said, you know, there are a lot of people here in heaven, and they're not supposed to be here. But I received them. They never completed their destiny or reached their destination. You see what I'm saying? He said, I didn't take them home. Did you hear what Kenneth Copeland said today in this session? That the only person God ever made sick was Jesus? And you're going to tell me God put a cancer on you to teach you something? Let me give you a good black statement. Yo, mama. <laughs> he ain't putting sickness on you to teach you something. And the only person, I love what Brother Copeland said. I said, I hope he preached because God give him revelation. Whoo! And he said, and the only person he ever took was Jesus. You see, faith has a divine power to discover Christ. Faith comes with an implicit trust in Christ. Faith seeks for its comfort. What is that comfort? Contact with Christ. Faith feels a change from the touch of Christ. When she touched him, by God, faith felt the change. See, and there is a vast difference between thronging Christ and touching him. How many people were in the Holy Ghost meetings? I heard someone tell me this the other day. I don't know if it's true or not. I'll just repeat it. They said in Catherine Coleman's meeting, man, thousands of people got healed, but 90% of all of them lost the healing. How do you lose a healing that God gave you? Christians. Boy, you better stay close because you'll probably lose that. How many times you might have been diagnosed with cancer? My God, God heals your body, my Lord. And your family, they all be, ought to be shouting, but they come to you. But you know it comes back. Uh, you, you, you. See, that's people thronging instead of touching. I made up my mind when I come to church, I want to touch God. I want to say, hello, Jesus. Hi, Jesse. Notice both our names starts with a J. There's something spiritual about that. I, I don't know what it is, but I, I'd rather believe that. And do you know why you want things? Do you ever wonder why you want things? I'm going to tell you what the, church, what the world says in the church. Well, because you're greed. No, your faith insists on you possessing that possession. That's why you can't get it off your mind. My God, why do I want that thing so much? Because your faith saying that is yours. You're going to let the devil control what's yours. It insists on possessing that possession. But most people know about faith and don't know faith. That's what God said about Abraham, for I know him, that he'll teach his children. So let me say it again. Faith has a divine power to discover Christ. Faith comes with an implicit trust in Christ. Faith seeks for its comfort, and that comfort is close contact with Christ. Faith feels a change from the touch of Christ. So what I'm saying today is there's a vast difference between thronging Christ and touching him. I want to touch him. The reason why you get healed because you touch him. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just coming to the meeting. 
You touch him. And when you touch him, brother, your faith's going to know something happened here. I heard Brother Copeland say this. And he tells me when I quote him, I got to quote him correct because so, he get on my case if I don't. So I want to I believe when he was working with Old Roberts, Old Roberts told him, you don't touch nobody until you're ready to release your faith. Is, is that right, Brother Copeland? Okay. Yes. <laughs> in other words, don't, don't go up to somebody like this. I hope this works. <laughs> 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 no, you got to learn to release. And when you release, God begins to flow. You see what I'm saying? So faith is seeking for its comfort. And that's contact with God. Let me tell you something about faith. We love all that manifestation stuff. Come on, boy. Let me tell you what Jesus did. Let, you know what God loves? He likes to chase. He likes you doing this. My God, look at that boy. Is he believing me? And he can't see anything, but he's walking by faith and not by sight. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you see that? That's what that lady said. She wasn't supposed to touch him. God violated the rules of the religious world of that day. He touched a leper. You don't do that. He said, I'm God. Do whatever I want to do. Yes, sir. He violated the rules and did something. He said, I will identify with that leper. But when I touch him, not only will he be healed, He'll be made whole. If leprosy ate his nose off, I'm putting some plastic surgery, a new nose. The other day I was with my granddaughter. She said, what is this, grandfather? I looked at her and said, time. Time. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. You got the same thing. So I don't want to just go to church for church sake. I don't want to just chase the miracle workers so I can see a healing. I want to touch God. And I want God, because when you touch God, you stop him. He turns around. Who touched me? Now watch all the preachers. The first pope said, you know who the first pope was? Peter, according to the Catholic Church. You ask who touched you? All these people looking around, touching, pressing on you. How many people do that all the time but never receive from God because they never touched him because they didn't have nothing within them? She said within herself, I like that. She already made up her mind. Let me just make it simpler. I am a success going somewhere to succeed. Amen. If I can just get, if I got to get in my hands and need people stomping my fingers, I don't care. I'm going to touch him. Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? Write this down. Faith is modest. It's humble. It's unselfish. It's ingenious. And it's powerful. Even when it's tested by difficulties. Let me say it again. Faith is modest. It's humble. It's unselfish. It's ingenious. And it's powerful. Even when it's tested by difficulties. When Jesus said, who touched me? That lady was just trying to get away, Billy, because, you know, you don't want to get caught here because you know how many people, they'd stone you in a second. Jesus, he looking around. See, you can't hide from God. I tried to hide from God as a sinner, but I had a praying mama who God showed her where I was, which I did not like <laughs> at all. She told me one time at 16 years old, I heard you lying to that girl. I was lying to that girl. I lied so much to girls, I had to write them down so I remember what I said. I ain't going to lie. Don't look at me weird. Maybe most kids, I mean, I was just a heathen from hell, Billy. I said, how you know that the Lord told me? I said, what's her name? Mama told me her name. Mama found me in a, a, a sex club. That's before I was saved. <laughs> I want to make this announcement. Before I was saved in Reynosa, Mexico, in the red light district. My mother was in Berg, Louisiana, which you don't even know where that's at. I am in Reynosa, Mexico, with a naked woman dancing on my table, me and the drummer, Jimmy, everybody screaming and hollering. Everybody speaks Spanish. Cost 50 cents to go over a cab and $20 to get back to the border. <laughs> they just wanted to get you there. Red light district. I, I was a heathen. We just going down and see what's going on. And to make a long story short, a man called, you heard me say, a man on the phone, he said, is there a justice to plant this hair? Is there a justice to plant this hair? 
Jimmy Spencer looked at me and said, that's your real name. My real name was Jerry Jackson back at people, people that know me from the rock world that I, I was in called me Jerry. J-A-X-O-N. Look good in lights. <laughs> On the albums that I did, all that kind of stuff. He said, that's your real name. I said, ain't nobody know me in no Renosa. He said, well, that's your real name. Is that adjusted the planet's hair? I went, hey. I walked over there and I thought, I said, hello. And mama said, I see you, little heathen from hell. That's a true story. I mean, I looked at the phone. What? She said, the Lord. My mama should have been black. She was white. She said, the Lord. I want to let you know the Lord showed me you little heathen from hell what you're doing. And I tell you, you better get out of there because I'm going to ask God to kill both of you. I said, bye, mama. I hung the phone up. I went to Jim. I said, let's get out of here. Mama's praying for God to kill us. Let's get. That's a true story. That's a true story. How could she do that? She didn't throng Jesus. She touched Jesus. Are you going to touch him tonight? Or are you going to let Jesus touch you? There's no way she could have known I was there. I, and I prayed leaving that sex club. I said, oh, God, don't let mama tell Kathy. Because Kathy was th not there, but she was, in, uh, she was visiting her mama. I was a heathen from hell. Don't look at me weird, you too. I, I, I smoked enough dope, took trips, never left my house. So I could fly with the birds, you know what I'm saying? Woo, I mean... I never forget. I heard a person speak, speaking tongue one time. I said, uh, "What they smoking?" Cause they look like they're having themselves a good time. See, a lot of people Sunday morning thronging Christianity, but never touching Christ. Their faith is aggravated because it doesn't have comfort because it can't get into contact with Christ. It has no trust that Jesus would, you heard people say, I know God heals, but will he heal me? But let me tell you something. The true faith is very, very modest, very humble, very unselfish, very ingenious and very powerful. Even when it's tested by difficulty. What was the difficulties? The lady didn't want nobody to know. You know why Jesus pulled that woman out of there? You want a little revelation? Relics. What? Religious relics. That was a big thing. If you could get something that was owned by Jesus, they sold them relics by the thousands and thousands of dollars. George Whitfield was my favorite preacher. He's in heaven. I, I've been the way he was buried. They literally busted open to his in his casket and pulled one of his bones out of the casket. They had to seal the thing. They said, if we got this, we can win a war. Relics. Jesus knew. My God, people say, if I can just get that robe, if I can get something, he got... Watch this, the Holy Grail. That's why he exposed that woman to let them know that it wasn't the clothes. Now, write this down. Her power was not in her finger. Her power was in her faith. Because she said within herself. It wasn't in her hands. Hands is just the receptacle that that faith is flowing through. It was within herself. It was not in her finger. It was in her faith. You know, about the, you know about the clothes of office in terms of the helmet of salvation, right? Breastplate of righteousness. Loins girded about with truth. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The shield of faith. The sword of the spirit. Now, when I say that, what do you see? You see a, a, a person in uniform with a sword. And you're looking at the wrong thing. The sword is not in your hand. It's in your mouth. Amen. The word of God is what's coming. It's what cuts Satan to pieces. Not this. That's man's way of physicality. It's the word of faith. The Bible says which we preach because that is the scalpel that gets rid of anything that you may have in your body, whether it's physical, whether it's spiritual or whether it's financial. See, never be in a hurry. Write it down when you are conscious of supreme power. She didn't get in a hurry. She just was crawling because her faith was not in her finger. Her power, it was in her faith. You never get in a hurry when you're conscious of supreme power. 
My mother made me go to a meeting with William Branham. I hated church. I hated it with a passion. Betty is here. I've been knowing Betty since, what, 14, 12, something like that. Her father is the one started me out in the ministry. Her father. You know what my mama said about Betty? Get a shot of Betty. Watch this. She said, no, no. My mama said, you don't get around that nice girl. You will ruin that girl. You are heathen from hell. You stay away from that girl. So I said, all right, mama, I'll do that. It'll be nice. But I've been knowing her, just, but her father just loved me and started me out in the ministry. Now, you got to understand something about this. I, I, I just didn't like church because I didn't know anybody that was believing anything. Everyone I knew believed in healing was sick. <laughs> Everyone I knew believed in prosperity was broke. I didn't see no evidence of nothing. I thought, well, why do I want to waste my time on people They say this is all true and they don't get any of it? And don't make God mad or you kill you. So, hey. I take my chances with the devil. At least I can see him. <laughs> How come they pay me so much as a rocker, but they wouldn't pay me nothing at the church? How come when I start in the ministry, they stole my offerings? How come they didn't steal my money when I played rock music? Because I work for the mob. It will make you an offer. You don't refuse. <laughs> You're going to pay me. Because they own most of the nightclubs in those days. They own, they own Vegas. They owned all that way back when. Now I would built all that. Now it's junk bonds, which means right, junk. Just thought I'd tell you that. But when I went to church, oh Lord Jesus, you know, yeah. Wait a minute. I thought, well, my God, man. I mean, if I'm gonna make a living, I want somebody to at least pay me. But I loved about Kendall Copeland. I heard him say this one time: "Blew my socks off. God will pay you more than anyone will ever pay you." Boy, I thought my experience has not done that. I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and the buckets were full every night. And Billy, you know what they gave me? A Dr. Pepper. I still got, I ain't drinking that Dr. Pepper. I work too hard for that Dr. Pepper. I sweat like a Missouri mule for that Dr. Pepper. If you ever come to my office, tell them to take you in my office and let you look at the Dr. Pepper. It's sitting there, it's an old Dr. Pepper bottle. Say, thank you very much. One lady I went preach for one time, she said, I'm gonna give you $10 to eat. And if you go to, if you go to Popeye's and you buy a Diet Coke, you, they'll give you a biscuit. True story. I ain't never had the devil do that. Devil gave me surf and turf. Church gave me cholesterol, piece of chicken, and a biscuit. You know why? Because that's what was in them. My mother said, would you please go to a youth camp? I'll tell you another story in just a minute. We used to go to youth camp. That's where I met Betty's father. Well, her brother is the, what, uh, the general secretary of the Assemblies of God in Springfield, something like that. I, what, what, assistant, something like that. He's up there. He's like Vice President Pence, but in the Assemblies of God. I know him real well. He said, hey, Jesse, you play guitar. I said, yeah. He said, won't you play? I said, all right. Now, this is a Pentecostal thing. So this ain't Baptist, you know, because bringing in the sheaves, it don't take much talent to play bringing in the sheaves. <laughs> you know, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. <laughs> it, it, it don't take much power. You get over the Pentecost, he got on the platform. He got, he got on that one. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Woo, Jesus. Well, you can play a little faster. So her brother said, I'm playing. And I, I played rhythm guitar, lead guitar, bass. I play 11 instruments. And I, I've been playing guitar since I'm six years old. I mean, I played in Bourbon Street. I brought my teachers to strip joints. I got A's. I ain't lying. They couldn't get in there. I'll get you in there. Don't worry about that. You look at a man for ourselves. I was a heathen. So I stopped playing. So Alton said, get, do, get, do a ride. That means do a solo. Bro. And I'm just kicking like that. Oh, Jesus. Three preachers just had a flaming fit. 
Now, her father, who is now in heaven, he's just dancing. Come on. He said, I like that kid. Word, man, I take that guitar. Word, and my God just running right down that platform. And kids going like that. You know why? Because all they ever heard was bringing in this shit. See, I had it in me, and I had an outlet to let it flow. They came up there in the middle of the song and unplugged my amplifier, <laughs> unplugged my guitar. He's acting like Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley is a lot older than I was. I wasn't acting like Elvis. I, just, I looked at them, and I can't tell you what I said. But it wasn't tongues. You, it, it, you, you, you could not misinterpret it. And I made up my mind right there. I ain't never going back to them crazy fools. I started to walk off and her father grabbed me by the arm. He said, don't believe, don't worry about them boys. Come on, young man. He grabbed me. He said, you're talented. God can use you. I said, them, you, you, you. he said, whoo, whoo, kind of hurt my ears. Who? I said, I'm, you, 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 you. he said, who? Not too loud, not too loud. <laughs> I, I was cussing, buddy. And I was good at cussing. He pulled me over there. He reached over there and plugged that guitar back in un, and plugged that amplifier in Jeremy. He said, play. And he looked at them three and he was a big man. He went like this. I said, I like this guy. He must belong to one of the families. He let me play. I never forgot that. And I never forget, he said, young men, they shouldn't have done you that. I said, I ain't never come back to this blind. Ooh, not the blind, not the blind. He said, you just need Jesus in your life. I said, listen, this Jesus stuff is not for me. You see, all in people thronging, mm -hmm. never touching other than her father. That's so important. My God. And I left. I went in the world. I was like Jerry Lee Lewis. You know, he, was, he went to Waxahachie to be a preacher. But because he th they thought he was a little too loose on the piano, they throwed him out. That's true. How many great people that came from the church but couldn't be there because the throngers were there. And they wouldn't allow people to have what was in them to be expressed. Mm. Because you see that faith stuff. See, that man was, his faith, Brother Hander Garrison was his name, but was, was modest. It was humble. And in the midst of this difficulty, he tried to help me. Write this down. Never be in a hurry when you're conscious of supreme power. Now watch this. See, God don't care about time because time don't exist for him. J. Harris's daughter is in trouble. He's trying to get Jesus to that house. Wouldn't you if you had a 12-year-old daughter sick? You do everything you could, right? But something happened. See, Jesus violated rules. It's called a divine interruption. The lady with the issue of blood. She was a divine interruption. Jesus needed to be touched. God needed to be touched today. Did you touch him? Did you worship him? Or did you have, you didn't have enough time for that. That's why I'll witness in public, I'll shout in public. Jerry and Carolyn took us to, uh, to, for lunch today, uh, Papa Cedars, I like that Mexican food, Lord Jesus. I mean, I, you know, it's best, it, I like that sauce, I eat it like soup. John Hagee said, there nothing can live in your body or your colon, you will kill it with pepper. I've never seen that like that. <laughs> well, I had a colonostomy. And he said, you got a pretty colon. I didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? I said, look like you enjoying this. <laughs> well, I said, now, Jerry, he said, now, Jesse, this is my town. I said, no, this is not your town, Jerry. Your town, Crowley. We always fight a lot. Like, well, fight, that's the wrong word, but we're always trying to see who's going to pay the bill. I said, when you come to New Orleans, that's my city. Your money is no good in New Orleans. This ain't no good. Well, he said, you're in my town. I said, no, no, we're not in Crowley. 
And I said, I'm taking the bill first. So he let me. Well, here comes this little wage. Well, she said, if you don't mind, I'm training this person. It just happened this afternoon or lunch. I'm training this person. I said, that's fine. So they took care of us and all that kind of stuff. And I had wonderful food. They gave him raw chicken, but they, I had wonderful. Food. <laughs> so he had to send the chicken back to kind of get it cooked a little bit. And hallelujah. And I thought, so we, anyway, having a nice time. And I love to bless people. Now, when you say that, people write you, well, would you do this? No, I mean, I'm looking to be a blessing. Who taught me that? Kenneth Copeland, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, glory. Every time I went, I mean, they always bless us. So here come the girl, you know, and I, I forgot now what the bill was, $78, $77, I can't remember. So I looked at her like, you know, I like to kind of see in the eyes. I said, now here's $80 that takes care of the bill. And I saw her go, which means there ain't hardly no tip, right? I said, now here's $100 for you. She goes, can I hug you? <laughs> Did she say that? Can I hug you? I want to say, do you feel strongly about it? <laughs> I said, sure. You can hug. She said, yeah, I, I never had anybody do that before. I said, well, everybody's got to make a living. I'm not bragging about that. I could brag more with a hundred bucks in my pocket. I gave a hundred dollars. I, I could brag more with that. But she said, who? I said, well, you did a good job. And it was a blessing. The Lord bless you. People don't know what to do. A hundred dollar bill will make a Buddhist say Jesus. <laughs> you understand? I'm telling you, you ought to try that sometime. You go into a restaurant and you slap a hundred dollars on somebody, they'll go, Jesus! <laughs> Whoo, Lord! Can I tell you one, another true story? I got a lot of vehicles in my ministry. And I like, when I come here, especially the believers, I, I can wear boots because you, you don't wear that too much in New Orleans, but, you know, but Cow Town. Now, like I, I like boots. And, I, and I, I drove up and I didn't know this little shop was owned by a Muslim. So I just stopped and, you, you know, pumping my own gas. Some of you heard me say that. I felt a little Lord. He just said, say that again. So, you know, I, I went in. It's kind of like a little, what y'all call them, 7-Eleven, you know, a stop and go, whatever you call it. Just, you know. So anyway, uh, I'm in line like that. And uh, the lady asked for something. So he walked away from the counter to go get it for her. And it wasn't that far, just over there. Come and he looks at my boots. He goes, ooh, that's a pretty boots. And I said, Jesus, give me them boots. He went, what? I said, Jesus, give me them boots. He said, Jesus, give you those boots. I said, Jesus, give me them boots. He said, Jesus, give you those boots. I said, Jesus. I said, well, what religion are you? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm a Muslim, Islam, you know, Islam. I said, Muhammad never give you any boots? He goes, no, no, Muhammad don't give you no boots. <laughs> it was wonderful. I said it. I did it. Watch this. I, I knew something was cooking here. I said, Jesus, give me the boots. He said, Jesus, give me the boots. I said, Muhammad never give you no boots? Oh, no, no, Muhammad never give you no boots. I said, Jesus, give me these boots. Oh, they're pretty boots. You sure? Muhammad never give you no Oh, no, no, Muhammad never give you no boots. So I got, I drove to the, to the uh, ministry. I said, give me the keys to the vans. Now I had, I had 17 vehicles that owned, owned by Jesse the Plains Ministry. They got all over the place then. And I got a lot of cowboy boots. So I went home, got me a different pair of cowboy boots. <laughs> Took this van, went down to the gas station, filled it up, I walked in, he go, whoo! I said, Jesus, give me these boots. He said, Jesus, give me those boots? I said, yes, sir. I said, Muhammad, don't give me no boots. No, no, Muhammad, don't give me no boots. <laughs> I paid the gas. I went 17 times. <laughs> I must have spent $3,000 in gas. <laughs> I filled up every vehicle we had, and I wore a different pair of boots. I walk in, he went, who? Jesus, give me the boots. I said, Muhammad, don't give me the boots. No, Muhammad, don't give me no boots. <laughs> That's a true story. I said, you meet Jesus, you get some boots. Ooh. Ooh. Can, can a Muslim come to your church? I said, yes, sir. I said, anybody can come to my church if you like. He said, you must like boots. I said, you know, I'm trying to mimic his um, accent. You, you must like boots. I said, I do. I said, and Jesus give me them boots. I said, Muhammad never gave no boots. No, 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 Muhammad never gave no boots. <laughs> you know, he came to the church. I said, Lord, if you want me to, I'll buy him a pair of boots. He said, tell him, let Muhammad buy him a pair of boots.
No, no, don't send me no ugly letter. I'm not against Muhammad. I went back six months later. I said, uh, Muhammad, buy you a boot? No, no, Muhammad, I don't <laughs> I mean, I really wanted to buy the man a pair of boots. I'll be honest with you. He said, no, no. This is working on him. See, what's inside of you is what will change the outside of you. God is on an errand of love. That's what was happening. Even our imperfect faith brings a blessing. Even her faith may have been imperfect because she should not have touched Jesus according to religion. But God was on an errand of love to take care of Jairus' daughter and to take care of that girl. Are you seeing that? Write this down. Never forget the hour your faith was born. When was your faith born? Because it was before the touch. Because she said within herself. Her faith was born before she ever put her hand on the hem of his garment. When was your faith born? I can remember when mine was born. I remember I said, Lord, I'm going to work for you if you want me to. Never thinking I was going to be a preacher. When I was sounding properly, Eric, I'm pretty good with money. Why? I had to work for it. I, I've been working full time since I'm 11 years old. I, I knew how to work and how to take finance, invest, do different things. I mean, my Lord, I, I mean, my brother never had, my oldest brother never hardly had any money at all. Because, man, I was cutting grass when he, he wanted to play around. He'd give me a few dollars and I'd try to work it this way, work it that way, you know. All kinds of stuff. Got, I became friends with influential people as a kid. Became a, you know what a soda jerk is? Look at the young people. Every, every uh, what do you call that, pharmacy, uh, drugstore had a soda fountain. How many of y'all remember that? Soda fountain in there where you got cherry Cokes. Remember those things? That's when you could drink and eat sugar and it was okay. <laughs> That's when everybody enjoyed eating. Remember that? Cherry Coke. Watch this, a chocolate malt. Now you can barely get a milkshake. You don't get no malt. Jerry found a malt place. My God, I was at his house here in uh, Weatherford, right? There's a malt. He got a chocolate malt. I got something else, and Carolyn got something, and Kathy got something. And I said, can we taste your malt, Jerry? Jerry's kind, yeah. But all of us wanted his malt. After we take, oh, can we have your, no, no. So his faith knew what to do inside. <laughs> Boy, I mean, that malt was wonderful. I hadn't had a malt, good God, 30 years. Huh? Double a double malt. He said, give me double malt. J Jerry believe in the double. <laughs> double malt, that thing was wonderful. So I would go in there and I worked in the soda fountain. Well, I met lawyers and doctors, judges. They would come in to get an ice cream. Ice cream costs a nickel a scoop. My God, I never forget when Coke went to six cents. I told my mom, we got to quit drinking Coke. I ain't got a penny. I don't have another penny. I only got a nickel. How many people remember when it was six cents? Anybody? How about when it became a dime? Remember when you paid 10 cents for a cup of coffee? You got to pay 10 cents just to smell it. Nah. <laughs> I wouldn't meet people. I met jewelers. I met a wonderful man. He said, let me show you diamonds. I like jewelry today because of him. He said, and this is what he'd say. He was an old Jewish man. Let me show you what God made. And he'd pull a diamond out or a ruby or an emerald. And he said, look at this. Man can't do this. And I said, man, that's some nice stuff. That's when I first saw a Rolex President gold watch. It was $600. Today they what? $75,000 it just way up there. I went, wow. You know what he looked at me and said this? Brother Crank, he said this. One day you'll own one. He put faith in me. And I thought, I sure would like to have one. I did not know my faith at that point was born and was insisting on owning one of those. Now you say, I don't believe that. I don't care. I don't mean that rudely. Faith insists on possessing a possession, whether it's spiritual, physical, or financial. And I don't know how many of them I've owned over the years. Lord, I don't know how many of them I've given away. I got 32 watches given to me at one time. I think I was preaching too long. <laughs> I had 32 watches given to me at one time, lady, 32 of them. Because I forgot my watch at the hotel 
I was preaching. I told everybody to stand up. Anybody ever knew, knew B.B. Hankins? B.B. Hankins, that's Mark Hankins' father. I was at his church. So I turned around to his associate. I said, can I borrow your watch? I forgot about these microphones being on. Can I borrow your watch so I know how long I'm preaching? Yeah. I said, I left my watch in the hotel room. So I put it, put it on, the, on the pulpit. Well, some man in the front immediately got up and walked out. I thought I might have said something wrong. I didn't know Jerry. He was a jeweler. He went to the store and took out, opened up all the cases. He had 32 and brought them back. And we were supposed to eat little finger foods after the service. He comes in. He said, these are yours. I said, what? These are yours. He said, I don't want you to ever be without a watch. I mean, expensive watch. 32 of them. Now, how are you going to get out of a church with 32 watches and a cop stop you? <laughs> what, what are you going to tell the cop? I was preaching and the Lord moved upon the jeweler <laughs> to, to give me 32 watches. Okay, put them on me. <laughs> Take, they think you done stole that. That literally happened. I didn't know what to do. I was at B.B. Hankins Church in West Columbia, Texas. So I'm standing with 32 watches. He walked out, yours. I said, what am I going to do with all these watches? And Brother Hankins said, I'll take one. <laughs> I said, well, take whatever you want. I gave away 20, uh, 30 watches that night. It was a bunch of preachers. They all came on. So I had two left. My God, I was excited. Man, I flew back home. I was so excited. I said, so I put one on. I had one in my, uh, in my briefcase. My God, I walked in there and one, one of my employees said, ooh, that's a pretty watch. The Lord said, give it to him. I said, I just gave away 30 watches. <laughs> but God knew that what was in me was about ready to change what was out of me. I said, you like this watch? Yeah, let me give it to you. Oh, y'all call me, well, boss, that's not, I said, yeah, it's fine. So I walk in. Then my oldest brother was working for me, Wayne. I, I, said, I called Wayne in. I said, let me know what's going on in the ministry. And he goes, whoa, you got a new watch? I put the other one on. I said, yeah. He said, that's nice. The Lord said, give it to him. <laughs> I, 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 I had him less than 24 hours. I said, Wayne, you like this watch? Yeah, I said, here, 32 watches. All right, ready for this? That's, that was Monday. Kathy said, we need to go to the mall. I walked to the mall. Now, 32 hours. Some of them were Seiko's. I mean, they were worth total, I guess, all of them. You know, Seiko's and uh, I guess maybe, what, Kathy, $15,000, $20,000 for all of them, I guess, you know. Yeah. I walked and the man walks up to me and says, Brother Jesse, the Lord told me to buy you a Rolex President watch. Oh, wow. He said, now, I don't know what kind you like. Here's the money. Kathy said, give me the money. I said, I gave away 32 watches. Man, just give me the money. You take the money? She said, I've been believing to buy you that watch. So we went in that day, less than 24 hours, and I walked out that jeweler with that Rolex watch. Kathy said, I bought you that. <laughs> See, you never forget. <laughs> I said, that's right. Never forget the hour your faith was born. <laughs> Miracles are always born out of the sense of a supreme need. If you have a supreme need right now, your faith is percolating. Yeah, it is. I feel it. And a miracle is about ready to take place. And it's taking place as you hear, because faith cometh by hearing. Do you see what I'm saying? Your faith is the hand which receives the blessing. Wow. Remember, miracles are always born out of the sense of supreme need. That woman had a supreme need. But she said, if I, but it was what, what, what was in her. For she said within herself. You don't have to tell everybody you're going to build a big church, but you got to tell yourself you do. You got to tell, you got to know within you, brother, there is big church mentality inside of me. And when you say that, people go, who do you think you are? Whatever God said you were. See, it takes Christ to do Christ's work. But you that have the Holy Spirit should be able to do it too and often in every area. Because it's what's in you that changes the outside of you. So my faith is being stretched. Who, Billy, Lord Jesus. I said that and I freaked out everybody when I told that lady about them stretch marks. Some of them went, Ugh. but you didn't say that after I finished that story. It brought great honor to that woman. I know it didn't make any sense. Stirred up people make noise. <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> That's what we've been dealing with in the, in, in the morning sessions. When you understand that, what is, what are you saying within yourself for tonight? Oh, let me ask you this. What do you want? Forget about need. He'll take care of that. What do you want? He's waiting for an answer. What is in you? What is what, what's your spirit saying in you to reach out to something you never thought you could receive? See what I'm saying? It's in every area of your life, spiritually, physically, and financially. If you stay with these believers convention, and I'm going to use me as a personal example, you'll get to a point in your life, finance will never be a thought. It'll always be there. Spiritually, physically, financially. It's a believer's convention. They don't say, come to the Southwest Almost Believers Convention because we got 47 people that doubt, but the rest of us are believing. No, no, it don't say that. A believer's convention. A believer's convention. Everybody in this place ought to be happy you're at a believer's convention. Everybody ought to get healed you're at a believer's convention. Everybody ought to be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed going out. At a believer's convention? I'll say this in close. You know how I got here? I was preaching a lot before I met Brother Copeland. I met Gloria first. Remember that, Gloria? Me and Gloria went to lunch. I think it was 1984 or something like that. She came to the church I went to. She said, this is Gloria Copeland. I said, hello, I'm Jesse the plant. She said, we've heard a lot about you. I said, you have. Okay. She said, Ken has too. I said, well, that's nice. We went to lunch. And years passed after that. I mean, I don't push myself on people. I ain't trying to get through the door and all that kind of stuff. I never have done that. I, you know, I said, God want me to do something, he'll do it. And even when I was a sinner, you know, I, I, I knew how to do business. But I mean, I mean, I wasn't just overbearing. I met Brother Copeland in the elevator coming down to John Osteen thing. He said, hello, I'm Kenneth Copeland. I said, I'm Jesse. I didn't, never thought, I, I had forgotten who Kenneth Copeland was. I went, and I saw him preach that night. I said, that's that guy in that elevator. Never thinking that that connection there. And then Jimmy Hester, Joanne Hester was here last night, calls me and says, I need you to preach at a full gospel motorcycle rally. I'm in Miami, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'm preaching every week. My first year of evangelism, I did 52 weeks. I did 52 revivals, 11 crusades and seven, and, uh, seven conventions and 11 crusades. I had Christmas off. Never have asked a preacher for a meeting. Nothing wrong with it. Didn't have time. God honored me. Still like that today. I got over 9,000 requests right now. I don't mean that privately. Listen to me. My God, man. But you know, and, and I know God didn't tell all them people to write me. But if you can pull a crowd, they want you. See, because they're into the thronging. I'm into the touching. You follow what I'm saying? I don't care how big your church is. How many people are touching Christ? Because if you're touching Christ... There ain't sin in your camp. Amen. If you throng in Christ, there's sin in that camp. You hear what I'm saying? So I, 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 I just, God did that for me. All I wanted to do was obey him. And I hired Fritz Brown. Right there. Oh, yeah, and Fritz, what people say. Yeah, and he started coming up and saying, man, how many times we drove, Fritz? Huh? Good God. Tear down, drive all night. Barely get home, man. Back on the road, just going with it. Just to do the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Still like that. Still like that. Before I got here, I, last Sunday, not this Sunday, but last Sunday I preached in a, preached at Covenant Church. And Monday night I was in Connecticut. Tuesday night I was in New York City. Dan Ann Stratton right there. Wednesday night I was in Pennsville, New Jersey. Thursday night I was in New Orleans. Friday night I was in Chicago at Tenley Park for Rob Thompson. Saturday I got back, bless God. To New Orleans, man, I was road hard, put up wet. Kathy asked me to preach Sunday. I preached Sunday. Then I flew here Sunday night, preached Monday. I'm going to preach Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I get back home Friday night. I leave Saturday morning to go to San Antonio. I preach Sunday morning and Sunday night in San Antonio. And then Sunday night, you know, sun, uh, two Sunday mornings for John Hagee. And then I fly to Houston uh, for Sunday night. I fly back home and then I go to Virginia to Phil Privets to preach. Then I come back home Wednesday. Then I go to Alabama on Thursday. No, on Wednesday. On Thursday is the rapture of the church. I hope so. For God's sake. 
I am the biggest jet, personal private jet fuel buyer in the city of New Orleans. I buy more jet fuel as an individual than anyone else. And I never charge the church. I just pay for it. Oh, excuse me. I pay for it. I'm not broke. Just to be a blessing. Well, why do you go to some of those small churches? Because Jesus went to the towns and the villages. I'm going where Jesus tells me to go. And I've never had a financial deficit. Why? Because I know how to touch him. I know how. I'm not just going to throng him. So I want conversations. See what I'm saying? And the ministry's cooking. People say, when are you going to slow down? <laughs> when you hang with Copeland, you don't slow down. <laughs> I mean, he's going to be doing this at 120. Right. <laughs> I know what he's going to do. He's going to say, Jesse, come up here. And at 120, bam, hit me on the back. Glory to God. <laughs> How you doing there, brother Copeland? <laughs> I, I like that. Very humble man. Who will just do anything. Him and Gloria. Go to their house. They cook me breakfast. I can't get Kathy to cook me breakfast. No, no, I, mean, no I just have One thing he did, I, I, I've never forgotten, I never will. It's so precious to me. I'm, I'm a procrastinator. You know, I think about things. I don't care what I'm spending, I think. I don't care if it's a major investment or something small. And I saw a jacket there. What's the name of that? Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Not Colorado, Colorado. Learned that from the Coloradians. <laughs> Color red. And I said, nah, I don't think I, I may not wear that enough. And he saw me. I didn't know that. We all walk around that little town. Beautiful place. Well, the next morning, I got up and that jacket was in his, on the ch chair in his house. I look, I said, oh, Brother Cole must have bought, a, bought that jacket. He said, Jesse, I bought that. I said, what? He said, I bought that. He said, I got it this morning, went to the store. I bought that for you. I ain't never had nobody do me that. I didn't know what to say. I went, are you serious? Yeah, put it on. You look good with that. I still have that jacket. I, I just look at it and I go, it's a gift. You know, somebody give you a gift that they don't have to. That's a wonderful thing. See, that's the size you don't never see. And you don't need to. That's not the issue. That's why I tell you to get involved in this ministry. Because my God is doing such great things. And thank God that I'm a part of it. And that same spirit got on Jerry. I came here, got on me. You know, in that motorcycle rally, I was supposed to preach Friday night. Brother Copeland was going to preach Saturday night and Jerry going to preach Sunday morning. That's what Jimmy Hester said, called a full gospel motorcycle rally. I said before the Eagle Mountain motorcycle rally. He said, I want you to meet Kenneth Copeland. I said, oh yeah. I said, I met him and I just shook his hand in that, in that, in that, elevator. I walk in, he goes, hello, Jesse, Kenneth Copeland. I said, how you doing? And then Jerry and I said, hey, y'all, we just standing there, you know, Jimmy said, introduce, he said, I'm gonna let y'all talk how y'all want to work this thing. And Brother Copeland looked at it and said, why don't we, uh, Jesse, why don't we all tag team tonight? I said, it started with me. I said, he said, let's all three of us preach. You want to do that? He said, me and Jerry do that all the time. I said, sure. He said, why don't I start first? Jerry, you get in the middle, Jesse, you close the gate. I said, that's fine. So all of us preached on Friday night. All of us preached on Saturday morning or Saturday night and all of us preached Sunday morning. And that's when Jerry says, because he's the last one to preach on Saturday. He said, everybody grab hand. So Brother Copen grabbed my hand. I'm standing like it. And he does this with his hand. He said, pray about preaching one of my conventions. You know what I told Kenneth Copen? I said, I can't. <laughs> he said, what? I said, I can't. I said, I'm loaded to the gills of meeting, brother. Come out. I said, um, y'all got a whole week. I said, Kathy don't even get a week of me. I, I, I said, but I, I can give you three days. He said, I'll take it. I said, all right. That's how it started. Never thinking I was going to preach anymore. I thought maybe one, I knew Jerry would, you know, he's preaching partner. Never thinking. 
and year after year. And now what, 27 years later? And he still looks the same? I have changed greatly. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, my God, never thinking I'd become a personal friend, never push my way through any of that kind of stuff, or even with Jerry, never think. But they found out that I didn't know how to do something. Bill, I didn't know how to play. I just knew how to work. Y'all taught me to play. And you taught me to cry. I ain't never cried. You can ask that woman. I just did not do that. I remember I saw tears in your eyes. I saw tears in Brett Coleman's eyes. You know what I thought? What's the matter with these guys? <laughs> they got to suck it up. What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> but it touched me. Because something within them was touching me. And I had to learn. It was not easy. When you've had all those years of suppression, and you don't show any kind of emotion and somebody mess with you, that's what the Mississippi River for. <laughs> you laugh at that, but that's the way I was raised, buddy. Man, and I learned to play. Still learning to play. And now as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm getting emotion. The other day I watched the movie and I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy said, you crying? I said, no, it, 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 it's a, <clears throat> a little sinus here. It just kind of. Uh, <laughs> and Lord said, tell her, you're tearing up. I was watching Keys to the Kingdom with Gregory Peck. Anybody ever saw it? Great movie, black and white movie. A man that gives his life to God goes to China. Now, let's see if we can touch God. Everybody begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on. Come on. Can you pray me something soft? Come on. 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 I want that pastor Reynolds. Get out of your seat and come up here. That pastor, his name is Reynolds. Come up here. Don't, don't be freaking out. Just come up here. Come. Where are you? I know there's a lot of people in here. Come on, people, pray with me. You want a miracle? There's one waiting for you. Who is that? Are you the man? Is that the man? Check his name tag. See if his name Reynolds. Reynolds. Somebody gave a note. Gave it to my wife. Wanted to talk to me. Now it's time to talk. Come on, people, pray with me. While that's happening, Butch, stand up. Come here. Both you and your wife. Come. Both of you. I don't want anybody else coming, please. No, no. I want to do exactly what God says to do. Grab your wife's hand. Lift them both up. Ba, 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 ta. Ba, ka, ba. Covenant place, covenant ranches went through some tough times. But the best is yet to come. Because you've been found faithful. The Lord would say that I have bragged on you to my angels. Because you were willing to do what I asked. You were willing to put me first. Watch what I will do with you and your ministry and the people I send to you. Jesus, touch these people. Bless them and honor them, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I thank you for it. Come on, people, pray with me. I want that Reynolds guy. Come on, people, pray with me. Come on. Maha Shaka. Come here, Phil. Phil, come here. Phil Driscoll, come. Bala, Phil. Pray with me in the Holy Ghost. You mark my words. Lift your hands up. We, we had some discussion, but the Lord told me to tell you, this coming from God. You haven't made a mistake. Satan has been wanting to shut you down because you see you have his job. When he hears you play, when he hears you sing, it angers him. He remembers what he used to do. 
You mark my words. Your ministry will do more in the latter, in this, in this time to come than it's ever done. You be of good cheer. I'll push walls down to get to you what you need. You be of good cheer because you see, spiritually Jericho is yours. They tried to wall you up, but they will not say the Lord because my word is true. And I have a worshiper here and you understand my sound and your, my sound will come out of you and permeate this planet in Jesus. Touch my friend. Bless him and honor him, Lord, through the authority of the spoken word. Give him all he need and desire. People, come on, pray with me. Come. Come Lift your hands up, sir. Lord, told me to ask you, what do you want? I'm a pastor. Okay. No, no, no. Listen to me. No, no. You know, I know you need you, you got the Lord. You don't need the Lord. You got it. What do you want? You got to get specific. Because the Lord told me in the room, he said, I'm going to have you meet that man. So I thought I would try to get a hold of you and talk to you. The Lord said, no, I'm going to talk to him. Forget the past because the past never sees the future. Know that my word is true. It makes no difference what you have gone through because you will go through it. And you will come out on the other side better than you ever have ever been. So you be a good cheer. I sent you here. At times you've been depressed, but depression will no longer be a part of your life. Yes. Don't be moved by what you see, but taught, taking what that man spoke today because there's something within you and you've been dragging, dragging, trying to get to Jesus, but you wasn't throwing him. You have touched me, saith the Lord, and see if I'll not do what I said I will do. Lord, bless this man, honor this man, touch him, Lord, give him the desire of his life, make him a success going somewhere to succeed through the authority of the spoken word. People, lift your hands up and bless the Lord. Thank you for giving that word. Come on, people, keep praying. Come on. Walk up. Come on, keep praying. Pray with me in the Holy Ghost. Come on, brother. Let me pray for you. Ask me for more. <laughs> You're not asking me for enough. Ask me for more. Come on, I can use you. I can do some things. You have a talent that I want, a talent that I need, a talent that I will use, and I'll start tonight. So ask of me and see if I'll not do what I said I would do. Because by this time next year, you're going to be a totally different man, doing a totally different things, getting done what you've always wanted to do. Stretch both your hands to this man. Bless him, Jesus. Honor him. Touch him, Lord. Bless him. Honor him. Come on, people. Somebody shout in this building. Come on. Stand behind her. Lift your hands up. <laughs> Bless her, Jesus. Put it there. Come on. Walk back in. Come on, people. Pray with me. Come on. Lift your hands up. Sir, stand right there. Lift your hands up. He said, tell him he can live as long as he wants. Give me some strength. Tell him, to, tell him I'll give him more strength than he had when he was young. Jesus. Touch this man. Honor him. Bless him. Bless John, Lord. Oh, <laughs> Woo, Jesus. He said, tell him I will grant him a divine visit. I'm coming, saith the Lord, and we're going to discuss and talk about some mighty things. Your time is not finished. Woo. Somebody shout somebody. Oh, I wouldn't mind having that myself. Come on, people, pray with me. Give your hands up. Thanks. I don't know what nationality you are. All I know you are a person that will obey me. So within the next three weeks, I will give you an agenda you never thought you could do. Seek my face, because girl, you are going to work. Oh, somebody shout somebody. Come on, Mahare. There's a person in this area you've been having problems with your kidneys. Don't come up here if you don't have, if, in this area right here. If you'll come, Jesus will heal your body. Come, he's in the healing mood. Been having problems with your kidney, pain. Where is that? Where are you? Quickly. Don't come, if that's you, well, come here. What are you pointing at me for? Just come, bless God. 
the Lord don't make no appointments. Come on, people, pray with me. I'll come back there. Lift your hands up, sweetheart. Are you ready to get healed? Yes. Are you a Holy Ghost woman? Yes. Stand up. Put your hand on her back back here. Lift your hands up. Stand behind her, boys. Well, Jesus, out of thousands of people, you picked her to be healed. Oh, heal her body. Touch her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. Let that miracle of God. Somebody shout somebody. Come on, people, keep praying with me. Keep praying with me. Come on, Jesus is in this building. Come on, I want you praying in the Holy Ghost with your head up and your eyes open. Come here, I want to pray for you, sweetheart. Give me a hand. Step forward, stand behind her. A little closer. You don't have a good image of yourself, but you're going to after tonight. You've been beating on yourself since you were a small girl. I don't know who you are, but am I telling you the truth? The Holy Ghost said, you've been beating on yourself, beating on yourself. The beating is over. I'm going to heal the scars that you put on yourself. And I'm going to make you see you the way I see you. And girl, happy days are coming to you, saith the Lord. Bless her. Stay behind the boys. Honor her. Reach out to her, God. In Jesus, come on, somebody shout this building. You, yeah, come, lift your hands up. Come on, stand behind the Holy Ghost is there. Jesus, just touch it and put it up. Somebody shout this building. Come on. Come on, girl. Lift it. Jesus, somebody shout this building. Come on. Wow, Jesus, the touch of the Lord. Bless the Lord. Come on, people, keep praying with me. Come on, the Holy Ghost is in here. Woo, gee. Come here. Come here. Lift your hands up and bless the Lord. Come on, girl. He sent me all the way to the back of this convention center. You got his undivided attention. I see a, I see a black boy with an eraser. He said, tell her I'm going to erase her past. She'll not remember nothing Jesus. more back there. And your future is brighter than you ever thought possible. And it starts tonight. Oh, somebody shout somebody. Come on, people, keep praying with me. Come on, pray with me in the Holy Ghost. Come on, pray, pray with people in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Soto. And the pastor section is a preacher that just flat want to quit. Just want to quit. You had, you've had hell. Hell. People not only hurt you, they enjoy it. You don't know what to do no more. Judgment is coming to those people. You were doing right by praying for them. My hero, where are you? Get out of your seat. Come up here. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Come on. Come. You're a minister. You just want to quit. Be honest. Come. That's you, sir. Maybe more than one. That's you, Pastor. Come. You too. All right, both of you. Come. Now, you're not kneeling before me. Remember that. Okay. Lord told me to tell you, go back home and don't pray for those people anymore. I'm going to tell you what I told Samuel. Don't pray for Saul no more. They have done much damage to my body and to my work. You let me handle this because if you get involved in it, you're going to do it wrong. I will fix it and I will bless you because you have stayed the course. Amen. Jesus, touch Thank these men. Jesus, touch these men. Touch him, Jesus. Touch him. Be surprised how much pressure people put on preachers. What they forgot to understand is we're imperfect people. Ask him what he wants. 
Pastor, come here. Lift your hands up. I see some blackness on the side of you. There's some sin back here. Right? Right? Yes, sir. You're not talking to me, sir. I wouldn't say this in front of nobody. That's a killer behind you. That has got to stop. You ready? Jesus, touch him. Heal that and let him never do it again. Somebody shout. Come on. Everything going to be all right. Brother Crank, can I pray for you? Your wife too, if you don't mind. Pray with me, people. I know it's a little late. Me and Creflo are out in the, we're out in the blocks the first Wednesday morning, so I, I got to get up and study myself. I had a, that all. Just hold your wife's hand if you don't mind. Hold your wife's hand. Come a little closer to me. Lift her hand up. Both hands, please. Yours too. Your works will far exceed your father's. There's been some people said something, and I'm going to shut their mouths. They said, well, he, he was in the right place at the right time. That's why he was able to do it. No, no. You always had it in you. You sought my face. You're a great giver. That's what Satan hates about both of you. You're looking constantly to be a blessing, and that just irritates Satan to no end. The Lord said, sit in front of everybody. I'm going to make you rich. Very rich. Money going to start flowing like you ain't never thought. And it won't be just to your ministry. It's going to be to you too. Because I know what you'll do. Instead of looking at it as harvest, you'll look at it as seed. But your harvest is going to get full. And I'm going to tell you, Brother Grant, God told me the same thing. And he made me a very rich man. And I thought, God, something I thought would all would make me happy didn't. What made me happy is that God wanted to do it. Ooh, I see some children that you're going to, in the very near future, that you're going to be a blessing to. Because you'll have, the, oh, Jesus, the finance to do everything that you want to do. Oh, Jesus, bless this people. Touch them, Lord. Honor them, Lord. People, lift your hands up and bless the Lord. Come on. Come here, Dan. Lift your hands up. Whew. Your feet are sore. Lord. Because you've walked so many places, so many people wouldn't walk. I've given you revelation upon revelation. But the word of the Lord will say to you, they don't understand it. Go back simple. Go back simple. And I'll send all those people that left you back to you. And as they say on the, on the simple instruction, then I'll open up their ears to hear because they don't understand what you're saying. So they, don't, they think they're not getting fed. Yet you're at a level that they haven't been at. So if you go back simple, not for a very long time, let me fill them up with some baby food. Then they'll begin to ask for bigger things to eat. And then those revelations and things that you have in you, ooh, Jesus, will come out of you better than you ever thought you would. And your work will flourish. And people won't be able to walk by the building without getting attracted to go inside of it. Don't worry about your daughter. She is in my hand and her future is too. And my servant, ask me for money because I got a lot. And I want to give it to you because you know how to handle business. The business part of you is coming back stronger than it ever was. Why? Because you're the only man can touch those business people. And I'm going to use you to do it. That's why you got to go back simple because they don't understand some of the things you've been preaching. Not that you were preaching wrong. You're just trying to get people to another level. But I'm going to fill them up with baby food. Then they're going to want something stronger. And then the full meat that I've given you they'll understand. Stretch forth your hand to this pastor. Father, touch him. Touch Dan and all that he does, Lord. 
Thank you for him, Lord, by the power of Jesus' name. And let it begin. In fact, let his staff call him before he leaves here, saying something is happening at the church. Lord, I decree and declare it today. People, lift your hands up and bless the Lord for that. Come on. Come on. Lift your hands up and bless the Lord for that. Come on. Just thank him. Ooh, come on. Pray with me. Come on. Ooh, come on. Come on. Pray with me. Come on. Oh, thank you, Lord. The Lord said, say this to the congregation. No one's old enough to quit. No one's old enough to quit. I'll tell you when to quit. Oh, my. Quit looking for your successor. There's a whole generation that won't need one. There's a whole generation won't see death. Quit looking. If I want your successor to show up, I'll put him at your door or I'll put her at your door. You just do what I asked you to do. And if you will call upon me as a whole body, I'll speed up the time. I'll speed it up. And we'll go to work in the universe. You can't hardly find a prophecy, saith the Lord, that hadn't been fulfilled. Thank you, Lord. Tell him what I just told you. He said, tell him my horse is ready. <laughs> this is closer, as the prophet said, this is closer than you think. Ma, 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 ma. Every stand up, everybody stand up. The Lord is healing a blood issue just like he did with the lady with the issue of blood in the Bible. God is healing 16 girls who have had endometriosis and been told by gynecologists that they can't have babies. You will have them. I will heal your body and you will have them. It's a promise of mine that I told you to be fruitful. Many of you don't realize what I have promised you because you hadn't looked. My Bible, my word that I wrote with you expressly in mind has everything I want you to have spiritually, physically, and financially. You go study it, not just read it. Make it priority. And promises will come to pass faster than you thought. The Lord just told me to tell you what he told me about the promises of God. He said, my promises are far more powerful than the sins of people. So if you've got a, a loved one that's not doing the way they, not living the way they should, it's just that tough luck that's born to you. You got the promise to that family down to a thousand generations. And, and, and can I explain that? You know how many generations has happened since Adam? A thousand generations? How many? 114. What? 114. So many people lived almost a thousand years. Methuselah, 966 years. You have no idea what God is doing. You just call it in and watch God do it. You know, at every believer's convention, I give an altar call for salvation. I remember the first time I did it, Jerry, I, I wasn't expecting anybody to come because it's a believer's convention. I can understand a revival, tent meeting, but there are a lot of people come to believer's convention that don't know the Lord. They throng in Christ, they're interested, but they're not touching it. So with every head bowed, somebody move that thing out of the way. I say it all the time. If you'd like to know God instead of knowing about God. See, I went to church all my life. I knew about God, but I did not know God. Never had touched God. Did not understand. Maybe that's you today. I'd like to introduce you to my friend who you can have great conversations with. It's called getting saved for the first time. It's called knowing God instead of knowing about God. 
I always go for that first fish. I throw that net out there. And the Lord interrupted me. He said, take it further. Always. Maybe you're in this building. You are having trouble with your Christianity. Temptations are getting the best of you. And you want that junk to stop. You have to repent for the same sin every week. It's frustrating when the Bible explicitly says sin does not have Lord over you. But it seems like in your situation it does. How do I stop that, Brother Jesse? How do I live that happiness that you seem to have? It's an old Pentecostal term. It's called rededicate. See, you get so close to God that when the temptation comes, and it will, but your proximity to God will destroy the temptation before it has a time to affect you. Because sin and temptation of any kind cannot get into his presence since he died, resurrected, and ascended. So with your head bowed, please, if you'd like to know God, that's called getting saved for the first time instead of just knowing about him or, and be honest with yourself, you're struggling with your Christianity, the temptation to get the best of it, and you want that junk to stop. Would you lift your hand up? Hold your hand up when I see it and acknowledge it. Thank you, I see those hands. Ushers, help me. This place has got a lot of people. Thank you, I see those hands in the back. Yes, open it up, up in the back. Look at the people there. Can I see another hand quickly? I have television lights. Way in the back, I can see you. Yes, I do. Yes, yes, I see your hand. Thank you, I see those hands. Look at the people. Thank you, Jesus. Up here in the front. I see your hand. Yes. How about on the sides? Hallelujah, these lights. Thank you, I see that hand. Yes, I do. People being honest with God, honest with themselves. Put your hand down. Everyone look at me. I'm going to ask everyone here that lifted your hand. That took courage to do that. Jesus, everyone he talked to, he called publicly. I'm going to ask you to get your Bible and your purse or whatever you brought with. That's the kids if you got them. I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and come stand here. In front of everybody? Yeah, in front of everybody. Yeah, what's wrong with that? You got drunk in front of everybody. You sinned in front of everybody. Why can't you give your life to God in front of everybody? He hung on a cross for you. Come on, give him a hand. If you're in the balcony, it'll take you maybe two minutes to walk down. Come on, give him a hand clap as they come from all parts of this building. Come on, you lifted your hand. Come on. Don't let the devil steal this wonderful opportunity. Come on, everybody sing it with Brother Lynn. Everybody sing it. Come on. Come on, David, sing that song. Everybody sing. Come on. I surrender all. Come on, give them another hand clap. They're still coming. Come on. Don't get in a hurry when supreme power is being manifested. The people coming from the four walls. I, I surrender all. Yes, Lord. I, I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender One more time. Everybody sing it. They're still coming. Come on. Look at the people coming. I surrender cap on. Come on, man. You're walking fast. Look at that. Give the Lord another hand clap. People. Come on. Look at the people that still come. Come on. Keep applauding. People are. Woo, Jesus. One more time, guys. Sing it again. Come on, everybody. I surrender.
See, there was something within you that's changing the outside of you. It's what's in you that changes the outside. All of you that have come forward, Brother Jesse would never lie to you people. I had so many people lie to me. That's what I love about Brother and Sister Coleman. They were textualists. This, this is what God said. This is what we believe. This is what we do. Wasn't hard to understand that. They didn't complicate it. You see, God said be childlike. And he said be childish. Childlike. Because children are born believers. I'm going to ask each and every one of you to pray a prayer with me. I'm asking you that are watching through the internet all over. Maybe there's some in Covenant Church right there in New Orleans where we are. Giving your life to Jesus. You know how, how many? We average about 4,000, 4,500 people a week getting born through our, being born again through our ministry. People have no concept of how many people, I mean, pridefully that we're touching all over the world. We don't talk much about it. Leroy Thompson told me, he said, if people just knew what you did. I said, I don't care if they know what, what I do. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is that people know who Jesus is, what he did. So, so they get involved. I'm a church man. I believe that people ought to go to church because the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Don't ever leave a church. It's the only thing in the world that the gates of hell can't prevail against. You see what I'm saying? It's a covering like you've never had before in your life. It'll protect you. So you that are watching all over the world, faith destroys all distance between me and you. God will reach his hand right through that camera and grab your hand and say, hey, I'll be you too. Two of us agree. I'll be you too. Will you pray this prayer and repeat it after me? Everybody in the audience, would you do the same? Lord Jesus, I ask you, come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. I confess my sin before you this day. I denounce Satan and all his works. I confess Jesus as the Lord of my life. I believe with my heart. I confess with my mouth that Jesus rose from the dead, that I am saved. I will no longer struggle with temptation of any kind. From this day forward, I will serve God and God will serve me. I pray this prayer to the Father in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Stand right there for just a minute. Give him a hand clap. You made it! Hey! <laughs> you made it, young man. Let me just look at you for a minute. You know, I love to visit with you here. I can't. But you know, when we get to heaven, I'm coming to your house. There's no night. You ain't got to worry about sleep. I'm coming over. I want to know your dreams. Because you see, when you get to heaven, you're going to dream bigger than you dream here. His will be done where? In earth as it is in heaven. There's so much work to be done in the universe. Whew. We are going to be a people that will touch the kingdom. See, he's the king of kings and he made you king. Well, you got to be a king over what? You got to have something to be king over. There's so much. If you don't have a good church, there's so many great churches. Kenneth Copeland kind of Ministry can direct you. If you're kind of close to Eagle Mountain International Church, it's a wonderful place. But there's so many great churches in that Dallas Fort Worth area. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I think we're going to pray for you. We're going to want you to go, whether it's a first time salvation or rededication. Rededications are so powerful. You get double the strength that you had when you first had it. Because you know how to receive it. We're going to take you in the back. It won't take long. One minute, maybe two and pray with you and direct you. You did the right thing tonight. Yes, you did. So, sir, you, both hands, if you don't mind. Everybody turn around and see that man waving his hand. With it. Would you walk toward him? All of you just follow him real quickly. This way your friends will wait for you. This will not take long. Sing it again as they go forward. Would you just do this? Usher, show them which way to go. Thank you, sir. Bless you. Oh, pleased to meet you. Thank you. Come on, just walk this way. Come on, that's all right. Come on, give him a hand clap. God bless you, sweetheart. They, we're going to do that back there because we have time. Hallelujah, thank you. Come on, give him a hand clap as they go. Thank you, sir. 
Come on, give the Lord a great God bless. Come on. gentlemen if that's your family and friends they'll be back in just a moment you see Kenneth Copeland Ministries has provided instruction for you that are watching all over the world still got a chance to get here oh I can't afford give God a job let God do what he want to do he ain't asking you to pay for it he's asking you to believe for it think about that so this is just Wednesday night. My God, tomorrow night, Brother Jairus will be preaching. Me and Creflo Dollar will be doing the morning sessions. I think, uh, who's preaching? Uh, Bill Winston and I guess Brother Copeland will be doing the afternoon sessions. We're going to have a wonderful time. Remember this. It's what's in you that changes the outside of you. Give Jesus one more hand clap as my brother comes. <laughs>